In this PowerPoint, we'll begin to look at how neurons create electrical signals, which act as a form of communication within the nervous system. Neurons are electrically excitable due to the voltage difference across their cell membrane. Voltage difference refers to a difference in charge uh, from one side of the cell membrane relative to the other side. So the next couple of slides will look at how that voltage difference is established. And this is known as the resting membrane potential. So it's an important concept. You have to understand how the resting membrane potential is established in a neuron when it's at rest. Um, in living cells, a flow of ions occurs through ion channels in the cell membrane. So remember that the, the neuron, when you look at a picture of the neuron, typical neuron, it's the entire length of that cell is covered in a cell membrane, a phospholipid bilayer, remember like any other cell type in the body. And embedded in that cell membrane, there are different channels that allow movement of ions, ions like sodium, potassium, chlorine, from one side of the cell membrane to the other side. So we'll look at the different types of ion channels and see what their significance is in establishing the resting membrane potential of a neuron, which allows it to be electrically stimulated or electrically excitable when it has a stimulus. In trying to understand how the resting membrane potential is created, and as well how the action potential or electrical signal is created when a neuron is stimulated, um, we first have to go back and review the ion or electrolyte concentration gradients that exist across the cell membrane uh, for all cells in the body, including neurons. So recall that the space inside cells is known as the intracellular compartment, and the space outside of cells is known as the extracellular compartment. And then what separates those two compartments is the phospholipid bilayer or the cell membrane. Now, the, we have two types of ions, general categories. We either have positively charged ions, known as cations, or negatively charged ions, known as anions. So you see, for example, chlorine here. Chlorine is negatively charged. This would be an anion. Um, sodium and potassium are both positively charged ions. They're known as cations. All right, so you have to know the concentration differences uh, across the cell membrane between these, these three primary ions. So in the extracellular space or extracellular compartment, we have much more sodium, right? The little blue balls here, much more sodium in the extracellular compartment relative to the inside of the cell. See, they only show you two blue sodium balls here. On the outside, we have more than two, so there's a, a concentration gradient. More sodium outside the cell than inside the cell. On the other hand, we have much more potassium, these pink blobs, on the uh, inside of the cell in the intracellular compartment relative to the outside of the cell. And we have more chlorine outside of the cell than inside of the cell. And we see also that there are protein structures. Proteins are negatively charged structures that are more predominant in the intracellular compartment. All right, so the significance of this is that, and what they're showing here with these three arrows. So the green arrow would re represent chlorine, blue would be sodium, and the purple would be potassium. If these ions are allowed to move across the cell membrane freely, so pretend that these are channels, ion channels. If they're open, um, these ions uh, will move down their concentration gradient in a passive diffusion manner. So for example, with potassium here, because there's more potassium on the inside of the cell than on the outside, if this potassium channel opened, sodium, uh, sorry, potassium would passively diffuse down its concentration gradient from inside the cell to outside the cell. On the other hand, if this was a sodium channel that opened, sodium would diffuse down its concentration gradient from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. And here we have a chlorine channel. If it was allowed to open, then chlorine would diffuse down its concentration gradient from the outside of the cell 
to the inside of the cell. So these movement of ions, and it's important, the charges are important because when these ions are moving across the cell membrane, so for example, when sodium is allowed to move into the cell, these are positive charges that are coming into the cell. So the inside of the cell will become more positive. On the other hand, if chlorine is allowed to move across the cell membrane, they'll have negative charges that are entering into the cell, which will make the intracellular compartment more negative. Okay. If potassium was allowed to move out of the cell by opening this channel, then we'd be losing these positive charges from inside, making the inside of the cell more negative. Okay. So it's important to understand these concentration differences between these three ions and uh, understanding next slide or two how we establish the resting membrane potential and uh, ultimately an action potential as well all right this slide we're going to try to um, figure out or understand how the resting membrane potential is established in a, in a neuron that's at rest Okay, so this image is similar to the last image we're talking about, a little more detail. So uh, this is the cell membrane here. So pretend this is the cell membrane of a typical neuron. Um, these are representing ion channels. So here we have something called the potassium leakage channel. Uh, here's a sodium leakage channel. Okay, so these are channels that allow the movement of potassium and sodium across the cell membrane. Uh, there's also another structure in the cell membrane embedded here known as the sodium potassium pump or sodium potassium ATPase. And this is a pump like structure that moves sodium and potassium across the membrane. So we'll talk about this uh, in a little bit. Um, look at the ion concentration gradients uh, that we talked about in the previous slide. So here we have these yellow balls, those are the chloride ions. And uh, here's the uh, sodium ions that are represented by the green balls on the slide. And then we have potassium on the inside represented by these uh, triangles. Also uh, included in the intracellular compartment, remember the inside of the cell, this would be the intracellular space or intracellular compartment inside the neuron. Um, we have more proteins, negatively charged proteins. And as well, we have negatively charged phosphate ions that stay inside the cell. All right, so let's talk about these leakage channels first. So when a neuron is at rest, there are a bunch of these potassium and sodium leaky channels that are in the cell membrane. And uh, as the term implies, it allows these two ions to leak across the cell membrane down their concentration gradient. So remember, there's much more potassium on the inside of the cell than there is on the outside of the cell, right? So here's a couple of potassium triangles and you see there's much more potassium on the inside. So potassium is leaking, constantly leaking out through these channels to the outside of the cell. On the other hand, sodium, remember we have much more sodium on the outside of the cell than we do on the inside, okay, represented by these green balls. So these sodium leakage channels allow sodium to leak from the outside of the cell to the inside of the cell. Okay, and remember these are both positively charged ions. So you have potassium ions positively charged that are leaving the cell. So you're losing positive charges from the inside of the cell. And at the same time, sodium, a positively charged ion is leaking into the cell bringing more positive charges inside. Okay, so these sodium potassium pumps, we have many of these pumps in the cell membranes. And uh, one of the important things to uh, note first is that these pumps take energy. So remember that the currency of energy in the body is known as ATP, adenosine triphosphate. So to run these pumps, uh, we have to power them with ATP. And it's important to know this ratio. So as, uh, as sodium is leaking out, sorry, as potassium is leaking out of the cell, okay, these sodium potassium pumps are pumping potassium back in, okay? And as sodium is leaking into the cell, 
these sodium potassium pumps are pumping those sodium ions back out of the cell. All right, now, uh, again, the ratio is important. You notice here for each molecule of ATP, the sodium potassium pump will pump three sodium out and two potassium back in, okay? And because these are both positively charged structures, um, that's an important fact because that's the difference in the ability of these pumps to keep up with the movement of these ions. Okay, will eventually cause the inside of the cell membrane to become more negative. Okay, so another way to say this is that as much sodium that comes into the cell, that leaks into the cell, these pumps can keep up with that sodium and pump it right back out again. Okay, so whatever sodium comes into the cell, these sodium potassium pumps can pump that amount back out. Okay, but the amount of potassium that's leaving the cell Okay, cannot get pumped back in at the same rate by these pumps. Okay, so these sodium potassium pumps can't keep up with the amount of potassium that's leaving the cell. All right, so those are positively charged ions, potassium. So the, the overall effect of, of this is the inside of the cell is losing more potassium, more positively charged ions than what these pumps can pump back in. All right, and so over time, this creates a negatively charged environment on the inside of the cell membrane relative to the outside of the cell membrane. So when you see these charges here, so you see on the inside of the cell membrane, it's, these are negatively charged or it's a negatively charged area. And on the outside of the cell membrane, it's positively charged because there's more positive ions on the outside relative to the negatively charged ions on the inside. All right. So this is what establishes what's known as the resting membrane potential. Um, this voltage potential we'll talk about in the next uh, couple slides. Um, the number, you do have to know the number, it's negative 70 millivolts, negative 70, we'll see this again. So that refers, when you see negative 70 millivolts, that's the resting membrane potential, and that's that charge on the inside of the cell membrane, okay? Uh, at this, in this state, remember that the neuron is at rest, and in this state, the, the neuron is, or the cell is considered to be polarized. There's two poles. Pretend this is a north pole, this is a south pole. There's two charges or a differential of voltage or charge across the cell membrane. And uh, it's like almost like a battery where you have a positive pole and a negative pole. And that allows potential for energy or or work to be created when there's a stimulus. Embedded in the cell membrane of the uh, neurons are four types of ion channels. So the previous slide, we talked about uh, one type, the leaky channels or leakage channels for the sodium potassium ions that we talked about. Um, so these are the first type, they're called leakage or non-gated channels. So non-gated means there's no gate on these channels. They're always open, okay? Uh, allowing sodium potassium to move across the cell membrane as we talked about in the previous slide. And remember, there's, there's relatively more potassium than sodium leaking across the cell membrane and that's uh, contributing to that resting membrane potential that we talked about on the uh, previous slide. So first type of ion channel are leakage non-gated channels. So these are the only channels that are functioning or working uh, when the cell is at rest, when the neuron is at rest. These are always open, allowing those ions to leak across the cell membrane. The second type of ion channel is called ligand gated. So when you see gated, gated means that there's a door on that channel. The door is closed uh, until something causes that door to open up. Okay, so with these types of channels, ligand gated, uh, and ligands refer to neurotransmitters or hormones. Okay, so we're gonna focus more on neurotransmitters as we talk more about the action potential in uh, neurons. So neurotransmitters, for example, acetylcholine, and in this example here, they're showing you uh, acetylcholine. Okay, so acetylcholine would be a ligand. It's a neurotransmitter. Uh, 
And uh, so here we see this is a ligand gated channel. Uh, it's closed at this point here. And when acetylcholine, in this example, the neurotransmitter acetylcholine binds to that receptor, it opens up the gate and uh, ions are allowed to move through that channel now. Okay, so ligand gated means these channels are closed until a ligand or neurotransmitter binds to that to the receptor site on that channel and that's what allows the channel to open up and whatever ion channel this is allows that particular type of ion to move across the cell membrane. The third type of ion channel is mechanically gated. So these are the types of uh, channels that respond to um, different types of sensory input. So if we you recall uh, the different types of sensory receptors in the body, so remember we have pain receptors, we have pressure receptors, uh, vibration, thermal receptors for temperature, etc. And remember that these are all receptors are all modified dendrites of sensory afferent neurons. And in the cell membrane of those sensory receptors are mechanically gated ion channels. So these are ion channels that are going to respond to some sort of a mechanical stimulus. So, you know, painful stimulus or a pressure or vibration or temperature stimulus. These are all considered mechanical stimuli. And so when these uh, gates or sorry, when these channels are subjected to a mechanical stimulus, they will then open and allow ions to move uh, from one side of the cell membrane to the other. Okay, so they stay closed, they're gated until there's some sort of a mechanical stimulus uh, particular for that receptor that will cause it to open. The fourth type of ion channel are voltage gated channels. So again, this is a gated channel. There's a door that closes this channel. So here they're showing you a door that's closing the channel. And these channels only respond to particular uh, voltages across the cell membrane. So for example, at rest, um, when the resting membrane potential is, if you remember the number, the resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts. Okay, so at rest, uh, this voltage gated re, um, channel, ion channel is closed. Okay, but if the voltage of the cell membrane changes, and here they're showing you at negative uh, 60, I believe it says, again, it's a small number, um, the, that, at that voltage, this ion channel will open and that will now allow ions to move across the cell membrane. In this example, they're showing you potassium. It doesn't really matter that it's potassium. Okay. Just understand that voltage gated channels. And when we talk about the action potential, we're primarily going to be talking about sodium and potassium voltage gated channels. So at a different, at a particular voltage in the cell membrane, that allows the gate to open on those channels, allowing either sodium and potassium to move across the cell membrane. Okay, graded potentials. So potentials refer to stimuli that are acting on the neurons. So when a neuron starts to become stimulated, uh, you will have either mechanically gated or ligand gated channels opening or closing in response to that stimulus. Okay, so if we go over here, remember that uh, here's, a, here's a neuron. Remember that we talked about the resting membrane potential that the inside of the cell membrane of the neuron, okay, all throughout the entire length of the neuron, inside the cell membrane at rest, the uh, resting membrane potential is negative 70 millivolts. So that's a, what this graph refers to, resting membrane potential. And if the stimulus causes opening of mechanically gated or ligand gated channels and it causes the inside so now the movement of ions that are allowed to move across the cell membrane if it causes the inside of the cell membrane to become more negative so we're seeing here we start at negative 70 millivolts if it dips down to let's say negative 75 millivolts that means it's become more negative on the inside of the cell uh, this is known as hyperpolarization so remember, when a neuron is at rest, it's considered in a polarized state across the cell membrane. Remember the North Pole, South Pole. Uh, 
positive charge on the outside of the cell membrane, negatively charged on the inside of the cell membrane. If it becomes more negative on the inside, okay, lower than negative 70, so let's say negative 75 millivolts, that's considered hyperpolarized. Okay? We're getting further away from the equator. That's another way to think about it. Think in this graph, if we continued up the numbers here and it went up to zero, Okay, and then we get on the positive side, plus 10, plus 20, plus 30 as we go higher and higher. Okay, zero would be the equator. So as we, if we become more negative, we're getting further away from the equator, further away from zero, we're becoming hyperpolarized. Okay, more negative inside the cell. If uh, some stimulus that allows either mechanically gated or ligand gated channels to open, and causes the inside of the cell to become more positive okay this is known as depolarization okay so in this example here's the resting membrane potential it's negative 70 millivolts and now if those gates are allowed to open and now it allows the inside of the cell membrane to become more positive okay this is known as depolarization okay we're becoming less polarized we're getting closer towards zero in this uh, voltage okay all right, so the signals are graded, which means that the strength of the stimulus that the neuron is receiving, okay, will determine the amplitude, strength, the size of this potential. Okay, so just, that's all you need to understand at this point. Okay, so the larger the stimulus, the greater the effect on that, on that um, resting membrane potential. This uh, slide just um, discusses the idea of uh, summation or illustrates the idea of summation. Summation refers to the fact that the graded potentials that we talked about on the previous slide, so the stimuli that are acting on a neuron, add together. And this is important because if there's enough stimulus on the neuron, uh, we'll see that once we hit a certain voltage, and when we talk about the action potential more in more detail, um, if we depolarize the inside of the cell membrane to negative 55 millivolts, then we will create an action potential. So summation just refers to the different stimuli acting on the neuron. They add together, and if there's enough stimuli, uh, eventually you'll create an action potential.